Well, hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to the uh, Spitfire podcast. This is our very first one that we're doing here uh, at the 332nd AEW. Uh, I'm Chief Master Sergeant Dennis Suslier, and today I've got one of our crew chiefs with us, uh, Kristen Lyons, uh, senior airman type. Uh, I met Kristen out on the flight line one day when I was spending time with Airmen on a Saturday, which everybody knows I love to do. And uh, I was just compelled by her story, and I, and I wanted to invite her to this first podcast to spend a little bit of time with me. Uh, so welcome, Kristen. I appreciate you coming and do this with me. Um, first off, why don't you just tell me a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? So I'm from Tennessee. I grew up in a small town called Cumberland Gap, and then lived outside of Knoxville right before I joined. Awesome. Uh, did you come from a military family? Uh, no, I'm actually the first to join in my military, so I had no idea what I was getting myself into. But ever since I joined, I have family members following in my footsteps. Oh, that's awesome. What made you join the Air Force? So I joined because I didn't want to get stuck in Tennessee all my life. I wanted to travel, see the world. Also, I couldn't really pay for college all by myself. I didn't think I'd be able to afford it. So that's the main reason why I joined. Oh, that's awesome. And now where are you stationed at besides here uh, in this wing? Uh, I'm stationed in Mountain Home, Idaho. Yeah. yeah. Join the Air Force to see the world that <laughs> took you to Idaho. What a beautiful state, by the way. It is. Yeah. The first time on the West Coast. So where are you from? Uh, so I, I uh, was born and raised in California, Oceanside, California. My father was a Marine stationed at Camp Pendleton. Um, and we moved overseas when I was 10 to Manama, Bahrain, off the coast of Saudi Arabia. Uh, and then we moved to Addis Ababa, Ethiopia for a couple years. So I spent my teenage years in Africa. Uh, my father was a Marine for the, the ambassador, uh, Marine security guard for the ambassador. Uh, after that, we moved to Albany, Georgia, where he spent his last two years uh, and, and then retired. And then we moved to Oregon. So kind of hard to claim one place. I, I love being a California boy because I love to surf. Um, but I, I actually enjoy the Northwest tremendously. So Oregon, I, w I, was, I was very fortunate to start high school um, in Oregon. My f the, well, I got there at the end of my freshman year, and then I was able to finish all my other years in one high school, which as a military brat, that was, that was pretty amazing. Um, so I claim everywhere. Man. And what made you want to join? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I said I would never join the Air Force. I would never join the military at all. So I come from a very, very, very strong military background. Uh, my dad has seven brothers and six of them served in the armed services. Uh, one Navy, two Army, the rest were Marines. Uh, my grandfather was an Air Force, Air Force uh, officer. Um, and so I, I didn't want to join the military. And I didn't want to join the military because I... I um, I had moved around a lot as a, as a child. And even though those were great experiences, I, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to settle down somewhere. Uh, but I found myself quickly going down the wrong path after high school. Uh, I was getting into some trouble, doing some really dumb things. And, and so uh, I went down to the recruiter's office and uh, slid an application across the desk. The funny thing is, is well, it's not funny, uh, I couldn't join. I was actually in a lot of trouble at the time and didn't realize that that hadn't caught up to me yet, so uh, the Air Force said, sorry, can't take you. Uh, and that's when I first realized I have something called determination in me. Oh. Um, once the Air Force told me, no, we can't take you, I was determined to join the Air Force. <laughs> so it took me a year and a half to get in. Uh, it took a lot of phone calls. It took a letter from my father. Uh, it took a meeting with the, the, um, the, the lieutenant colonel that ran that area for recruiting, drove down from Seattle to have a personal conversation with me. Uh, and the Air Force was kind enough to let me join with what they call a morals waiver. Um, I couldn't have a security clearance for my first year and a half in the Air Force. It was pretty, uh, so it was, it was pretty rough because I wasn't like everybody else. I was the kid that had to have somebody with him when he was doing maintenance on aircraft. I was the kid that couldn't go and get certain briefings. Um, so again, that's, it was great because it really, it really brought out that determination in me. I was determined to do well. Uh, you can't tell me no. You're not going to tell me I can't be in this Air Force. And so, you know, something I proud, pride myself on is since I've joined the Air Force until now, uh, every opportunity the Air Force has provided to me has been a blessing. I look at it as a blessing. 
uh, and and I'm not going to mess that blessing up. And so so really, it was kind of a good thing they told me no. Yeah. I think if they would have just accepted me right away, I'd have been the knucklehead I was at 19, yeah. and uh, probably not done very well in my in my career. So, you know, we talk about discipline all the time, and I think that the Air Force is really truly. Uh, embedded self-discipline in me you know I've had some I've had some rough supervisors that really really put the whip down on me when needed and I also had the supervisors that picked me up when I needed it most so, so. yeah those are the best supervisors yeah it's definitely they're scary at first I was terrified of my supervisor but that's the main person I look up to now yeah yeah you know and even even though supervisors you know I I, I tend to stay away from toxic leadership and bad supervisors. Um, I think that I think that supervisors in general try to do their best, and I, and I can tell you that I've been a supervisor of many, and I've not always made the right decision or said the right thing. Um, but all those times where a supervisor did do something to me that 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 I internalized, you know, that bothered me or or that uh, was not appreciated. Uh, I remember those too because I think they're just as important as the good the good things that happen to you, right? Because uh, when you go to ALS, you're going to start supervising airmen, and uh, that'll be your first touch point with our young airmen, and that's a huge responsibility, isn't it? It is. I'm excited, but I'm terrified at the same time. I yeah. want to lead new airmen just as I was led. Yeah, yeah. It's it'll be a scary time, but it'll be an exciting time, yes. and uh, I think the key is just to know you're not going to be perfect. And to be transparent and, and and apologize when you do say the wrong thing or make the make the mistake. Yeah. So Mark Walcott was very good at that, so I appreciate him. So what do you do for the Air Force? Um, I'm a crew chief, so okay. I do all the maintenance, all the jets. I launch the jets out, recover, just overall make sure everything is good with the jet. Maintaining the aircraft is pretty important. Uh, exactly what do you do every single day when you go to work uh, besides launch recover uh, aircraft? So usually when I'm in between goes, I'm making sure my jet's clean. I always clean the tires, the windscreens, so they can see perfectly outside. Um, if I have extra free time, I'm like cleaning up my forms, changing out streamers. Just overall, making sure my jet is clean. They always talk about having pride in your jet, which is cool to me to have my own jet with my name on it. So I want to make sure that it looks the best that it can. Yeah, you know, in my career, I grew up as a maintainer as well. As you know, I was a weapons uh, airman. Uh, multiple airframes, but every airframe I was on, I was always super impressed by the crew chiefs and how much pride they had in the aircraft that they maintained. Um, and there's a little bit of competition out there between crew chiefs, isn't there? <laughs> there is, for sure. There, so I'm starting to notice people like putting like little stickers on like the hubcaps, like trying to one up each other. Yeah. Like changing nose art, all of that. <laughs> yeah. But that pride in how well you maintain that aircraft translates into combat power, right? I mean, uh, you know, every time I talk to the air crew and you can see it, it's evidenced every time they go to the uh, to step to their jet there is a relationship between you and that that air crew isn't there there is especially with the like how my pilot was asking about like nose art and like the forms and all that it does give what the crew chief and the air crew of that jet way more pride to go to that jet yeah. for me to launch it out and for them to get to fly it there's way more pride in that yeah it's pretty awesome i heard i heard something about top flyers what's that all about so that's when the jet has uh the least amount of gabs and what's a the, gab so a gab is when something goes wrong you know uh we do like we're doing the best that we can for our maintenance but sometimes there's always stuff that's going to go wrong so there might be like a leak or like something with the electrical part of the jet might like go bad all of a sudden so that causes them to not be able to use that jet which is normal stuff so they have to go to another one so for them to get top flyer, you have to have the least amount of gabs and your jet has to be flown the most. Yeah, so. that's awesome. Competition drives greatness, really, honestly. So all the crew chiefs out there maintaining their aircraft and having, you know, trying to fight for that, that, that uh, top flyer, uh, um, 
I saw a sign out there. Is that what you guys got now? A sign saying it's the top <laughs> flyer that sits in front of the aircraft? It is. Which is pretty cool. Got people competing for it now. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty awesome. Hey, you know, being a maintainer in the Air Force, that's a lot of hard work. Um, did you see yourself coming in the Air Force to be a maintainer? Or did you have an idea of what you wanted to do that was different than that? So when I was first joining, I wanted to be medical. So that's what I studied throughout high school before I joined. You know, I wanted to go into physical therapy. So I was, I went, I was going to join to kind of go down that same path. But then uh, my recruiter was telling me that it's hard to get into medical and all this other stuff. And I was like, all right, well, I want a job that travels a lot and that's more hands-on. So I like to stay busy. And so he kind of tricked me. He was like telling me like I'd get to fly with the jets and all this other stuff, which that was cool to me just to be around jets. So I was like, all right, I'll take this. And then I got to tech school and learned it was more about mechanics. I was terrified because I've never touched tools all my life, but I don't regret it at all. I wouldn't change it for anything. That's awesome. So you've been doing this for about three years now. Tell me what being a maintainer means to you uh, in our Air Force. Uh, for me, it's all about having the people around you to help. Like how I said, I was less confident in being a mechanic. It's about having those type of people to give you the knowledge that they have and to show you like the right way to do things and you're overall just working together just to get like like a jet up in the air, a car, just anything in general. Like it's something you can't do alone. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's a, uh, you know, some people call it cliques, uh, but really maintainers, that's a tribe, isn't it? It's a, it's a family. You know, the 20-something years that I was a maintainer, my fondest memories and the people that were there for me when I needed them most were my maintainer. Uh, friends, peers, uh, supervisors. Uh, it's a unique world to live in. It's a very hard world. Tell me, tell me what your daily hours are like being a maintainer, making sure that the wing here has the air, combat air power needed to do the mission. So, so are you asking like... The hours. What are your hours like? So it's a lot of... It's changed a lot because of the flying hours changing. But it's mostly all of us going out there, making sure we have all the stuff to get the jet up in the air. And then whenever they come down, we're all helping out each other out, like recovering and BPO and all that. And then in between times, it's the family like joking together, just like playing cards, anything, just really getting that bond of us all together. Yeah, long hours. Uh, you really get to know each other very well. So yeah. it's a pretty unique tribe. Hey, um, so I know you said before you came in the Air Force, you were looking at doing physical therapy, kind of kind of found your way into this maintainer world. Do you see yourself doing this uh, long term? Do you see yourself serving four to six years and, and separating? What, what's your goals? I can see myself doing this long term. For it to be my overall like career, I'm not too sure of just yet, but I can see myself staying and building my way up and uh, just overall trying to make change in the field if I can. Yeah, that's awesome. Hey, I, I know, I have no doubt if you stick around this Air Force, you're gonna do great things. Uh, and even if you decide to separate after your first, first term, thank you for your service. I've got a question that I'd love to ask you and get your insight on. What are the things that you appreciate about the Air Force, the leadership that would make you stay and want to serve 20 years? I uh, know for my leadership, they really, they're the main ones that bring in that family bond that we have with each other. So if I were to ever become a leader, I want that. I want to bring that upon the people too, just overall. Yeah, for sure. I know, um, you know, being a maintainer, nothing hurt more than working an eight, 12 hour day just to have somebody come back behind me and, and tell me I didn't do it exactly right. You know, QA is very important for what we do because it makes sure we're doing quality maintenance. Yes. Uh, I don't think any QA inspector, you know, they, they're just like us, they're, they're maintainers. I don't think any QA inspector wants to go out and fail anybody. It's, a, it's, it's hard on their side too. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. Leadership protecting airmen is important. Knowing that there's trust in that relationship is very important. You know, 
I think when you have trust with your leadership, when they do have to be hard on you or correct behaviors, I think you tend to take that a little bit easier, it softens the blow a little bit because you know it comes from love. You know, yeah. I talk, we, uh, General Kunkel and I hosted uh, um, uh, Janine Sijon the other night uh, and she, she talked about her brother Lance P. Sijon who earned the Medal of Honor um, in Vietnam. And one of the things she talked about is, is if, you, if you do things from the place of love, uh, it can never be wrong. And so I think your leadership taking care of you and you know they're taking care of you is, is showing you guys love. Exactly. Uh, and so they can never go wrong with that. I appreciate that. Hey, um, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Uh, so for now, I see myself definitely being a leader, like how we were talking for this job. I don't see many women seven levels because I'm sure they're probably off somewhere else at a different base. I definitely want to be changed for that from where I'm seeing. I want to be a seven level. I want to be like the flight chief if I have to. One day maybe a first shirt. Just somewhere in the leadership just to show the very few women that do come in that, you know, they can do just as good as well. One of the things you always hear me talk about is equality and providing everybody the opportunity to meet their full potential in our Air Force. So no doubt you're gonna, you're gonna obtain those goals that you have set for yourself in the next 10 years. Um, kind of a hard question for you, being a female in maintenance, uh, there are very few of you out there. Uh, do you find that to be hard or do you, do you find yourself fitting in very easily into the, into the tribe? So when I was new, it was definitely hard. I was terrified. Like I said, I've never touched tools, so I was like, what are, what are all these guys going to think of me? Like, I'm going to be taken as a joke. And so I was terrified, but with that family bond that we have, they can tell when I get, like, hard on myself or down on myself about doing maintenance. And they're really good about, like, joking around and, like, showing me that, like, I'm actually not as bad as I tell myself that I am. So they make me feel like I feel right in every day. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, one of the teammates, no matter what. That's great. You know, we've uh, we've always got room to grow in our Air Force, and I think we're doing great things. You know, we have our first female Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, uh, Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, Joanne Bass, uh, phenomenal leader in our Air Force. Uh, hopefully, hopefully one day soon she'll be here in our wing, and you'll get to meet her. Uh, I promise you to introduce you to her. Uh, and she'll talk to you about some of the things that she's gone through in her career uh, growing up as a female. Um, what else you got for me? Um, so do you think you would have ever been a command chief at the wing here? Oof, that's a, that is a good question. Um, the answer is no, I didn't think I ever would be, but yes, I wanted to be. Um, like I told you when I joined the Air Force, the determination I had to prove to the Air Force that the reason they needed to accept me into this Air Force is because I was a good person and I could do great things. And that drove the discipline that I had throughout my career. You know, I set lofty goals for myself because of that. Uh, and, and one of the goals, and, and you hear a lot of airmen say it, I'm going to be a chief one day. I want to be a chief one day. And it's because we look up to our chiefs. Um, you know, I, I can name every chief that I've ever worked for in 25 years. That's how inspirational they've been to me. That's the impact they've had on my family and my, and my career. Um, and so I wanted to be a chief, and then I wanted to be a command chief, and then I wanted to be chief master sergeant of the Air Force. <laughs> I think it's healthy to set lofty goals for yourself and try to obtain them. Um, you know, at some point in our lives, you know, we talk about resiliency, and I think one of the things about resiliency is it's okay to fail. Um, I, I think that the way we build resiliency isn't by sitting in a classroom and talking about resiliency. I think it's by, by, by trying, failing, and picking ourselves back up and trying again. And so, you know, there were, there were two points in my career where I didn't even think I was going to make chief. Uh, and, and both of those situations were absolutely 100% my fault. Uh, things that I could have controlled and did not control. And so, um, I was okay with it though, because I was working hard and I was doing great things and I was doing the right things. Um, and, and then these two things just happened to happen uh, because of me. Um, but fortunately the Air Force 
you know, saw saw that saw it fit to promote me to chief, which is, you know, uh, one percent of the Air Force serves as a chief. Uh, and then, of course, what do I do next? Well, I want to set myself on being a command chief. So I set my sights, you know, a hundred meters down the road at command chief. Um, being a command chief is very selective, uh, and and I honestly don't know if I'd be a command chief right now if it wasn't for General Kunkel. You know, General Kunkel and I had a relationship. He was my wing commander at Mountain Home, where you're stationed at. Uh, he was Gunfighter One there, and I and I worked for him as his wing weapons manager. So, in your three years in the Air Force, what's your most favorable memory that you have so far? So, so far, I was Esther on my way here. So we stopped by Lake and Heath, and the best day was catching all the jets. And there was only ten of us. We were getting all this stuff done like as fast and best as we could because it was pouring the rain and then after all that the day that we sent them all out to come here that was this is my first deployment my first time overseas that was such a prideful feeling just to send all those jets out the way that we did that's awesome yeah. all right and what's uh for as long as you've been in the air force what is the best day that you think i've got two two that stand out to me the most uh, one, I was a senior airman deployed to Al Jabra Air Base in Kuwait. Uh, I was working armament back shop at the time. I was on F-16s out of Hill. Uh, and uh, our seven level had gotten sick and had been on quarters for 48 hours. And, and the A-10 unit, uh, their two individuals were actually out on an MRT at another location, a, a maintenance um, team that had to respond somewhere else. and the the uh, unit came in and they had a gun that was all jammed up and and uh, they they asked if i could help work on it and i knew nothing about a10 guns and if you've ever seen the gun on an a10 it's huge uh and i was so confident in myself i was a five level i knew what i was doing <laughs> and so i whipped out those to's and i started working on that gun and and we were able to get the gun turned uh the gun had to wait till the next morning when the seven level could you know sign off on that it was everything was done correctly uh, but that was a very prideful moment for me because I'd done something that was completely outside of my responsibility, mm -hmm. uh, but I knew I could help out the team. And it was really neat when the morning of their commander came in and he gave me a 20, uh, 30 millimeter round that was all chromed out and it was on a breech bolt, which is what carries the round through the gun. And he presented me this little plaque and, and said, hey, thanks, thanks for turning this gun for us. Uh, I was not part of their unit. I did not know them. Uh, and that was a very prideful moment for me. And it's one that just sticks out in my, my mind of, you know, when we tell airmen to accelerate or change or we tell them to proceed till apprehended, that's what I think of just, hey, I know I can do this. Uh, somebody will double check my work as a seven level, but I know I can do this and help the team. The other thing that stands out to me, uh, and I'll try not to get emotional, is, you know, the day my son uh, graduated basic training. Uh, my son is a staff sergeant at Kadena Air Base. Um, I was a single father most of his life. I raised him on my own um, from the time he was 18 months old till he, till he joined the Air Force. And to watch my son graduate basic training was pretty emotional for me. And it was, it was two weeks before I deployed, so I was able to go down for his graduation. Uh, I, of course, I brought all my dad and, and, and his brothers because they're all military retirees. Uh, and, and I've never seen a group of men cry so much, but we, we all cried quite a bit. Uh, but it was really inspirational to see, you know, my son joined the Air Force all the times I was gone, all the times I, I worked 12 hour days, all those times I missed a birthday, I missed a, a, a school play, I missed his musical. Um, he still thought so highly of the Air Force because he knows what kind of life it provided. You know, I got my education because of the Air Force. We've seen the world because of the Air Force. Uh, and now my son is seeing the world. He's at Kadena right now, and he's on his way to Spangdalem, Germany. And so he's living his best life. Um, so that's pretty prideful for me. Yeah, that sounds really amazing. Yeah. Well, that'll be you soon, right? <laughs> Maybe one day, yeah. You said you landed in Lake and Heath and loved it. So who knows what's next? Mountain home to Lake and Heath? Hopefully. Yeah. Maybe somewhere overseas. I'd love that. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Well, hey, Kristen, thank you so much for spending time with me. This is our first Spitfire podcast, uh, and you were the first person when, when they, they approached me and asked me if I would do these. One, I love to talk, obviously, <laughs> so I was super excited about that. 
But two, I knew right off the bat who the first person I was going to interview, and that was you. And the reason is, is because, like I said, that first day I, I saw you on the flight line sitting over there working diligently on your forms. Uh, and I brought you an Oreo cookie, and then, and then you showing me around the flight line uh, to talk to all those maintainers out there to let me see what you guys do out there every single day uh, meant a lot to me. But what meant more to me is the story you told me about how you joined this Air Force, what your plans were prior to joining, and now what your goals and your outlook on life is now that you've joined and you see a bigger, broader picture and your opportunities are so much greater. And that just really stuck with me. So thank you for spending today with me. Uh, thank you. I really appreciate this. All right.